Hello everyone and welcome to Van Vehicle Skyscraper 2020. My name is Jason Pritchard and I'm the editor of evtolinsights.com and I'm really happy to be given the opportunity to be part of this virtual summit which focuses on the implementation of urban air mobility in Latin America. In this video I'll be speaking to Jared Esselman, Principal of Aerial Transportation Solutions and who manages the statewide aviation system in Utah. The company is helping governments and corporate transportation agencies with quarter and land use planning. And Jared was part of Van Vehicle's fifth think tank, which talked about Latin American cities implementation. So Jared, really appreciate your time talking to me today. Absolutely, Jason, glad to be here. Great, excellent. Um, Jared, if I could just start off with the um, first question really. So are you able to tell me and for those watching, what will aerial transportation solutions be doing to help implement urban air mobility in Latin America? Well, hopefully anything and everything we can, right? That's the big, simple answer. Um, what Aerial Transportation Solutions does and, and what we hope to help people do is really define their airspace and also their land use, right? And then how those two, how those two worlds combine. Um, that's what Aerial Transportation Solutions really is, is looking to do is, is right now, where, no matter where in the world you are, you know, you can almost talk to anybody in transportation and the minute you mention airport, they go, oh, well, that's those guys over there, right? And if you're at an airport, the minute you mention highways, they go, oh yeah, we don't deal with that. But now we're gonna start merging those worlds, right? Airspace planning, airspace policy, land use planning, land use policy. We really are gonna start merging those worlds and that's what ATS wants to do. Great, no, thanks for that, uh, Jared. And what do you think then has been the issues then when, when you talk about one side with the, as you said, the airspace um, integration and then the other sides with the, the plans and the airports? What, what do you think has been missing, that, that missing pieces that have stopped those two parties working together? Well, that's a great question. The missing piece, what's the missing piece from uh, needing those two entities to work together? To be honest, um, I think, to this, to this point, right, since the Wright brothers, since the Wright brothers flew, or, you know, I know that's debatable across the world, whoever flew first, since that point, um, airplanes have always needed an airport, right? And since the advent of the motor vehicle, they've always used, whether it was a dirt trail or a dirt road or a paved road, there, there never has been this point where the two meet except for at the airport, right? I mean, the road goes to the airport, but other than that, planes and cars don't ever have to see each other if you don't look up um, or don't look down. So, but now we're getting to the point where we're, are, we're gonna have, um, I hate to say them, I hate to call flying cars. It's not a flying car. It's, it's not a low flying airplane. It's an aerial vehicle in a low altitude airspace that is going to intermingle with surface transportation for that last mile solution. I mean, this really is true intermodal transportation. And it's the first time we've ever had this in human history, true intermodal transportation. No, that's, pretty, that's really interesting to think as well. And it's, it's really exciting to see where this will go in the future as well, isn't it, uh, Jared? So it's really important, as you say, that all the connected parties work together to get to, to where we want to be as well, albeit 10, 15 years time down the line as well. Um, it just leads on to my, my next point, really, Jared, is aerial transportation solutions, you're, you're leading your own you ecosystem in Utah. What impact do you think then that you could have on the region um, of Latin America, given you've got all that expertise in Utah and the region is a bit different to, to what you're used to working with? It is a bit different than what we're used to working with, um, but there are similarities, right? All over Latin America, you're going to have high altitude, right? You've got those high altitude uh, cities, you've got those high altitude points. Um, you'll have uh, a plains area, and, and in some places you'll even have a little bit of desert, right? Not much, but it exists. Um, so I think that there's a real benefit in being able to design a system, right? Or design a, a process, which is what ATS does. Uh, we design a process that can fit any location and culture and, and be tweaked to be unique to that, 
right? It's not, it's not a, you buy it off the shelf, you pull it out of the box and it's one size fits all. It is literally, okay, you do buy it off the shelf, but it transforms to be what you need it to be. And for us, that's fun, right? That's fun. Because what works in Salt Lake City, Utah is not going to work in New York City and is not going to work in Bogota. Each of, those, uh, each of those cities, each of those regions needs its own unique airspace design, land use planning, corridor design. Um, culturally, urban air mobility in New York is going to be very different than urban air mobility in Salt Lake, which is going to be very different than urban air mobility in Bogota or Medellin or Cali. Makes some brilliant, brilliant points, Jared, and I completely agree. Is there, there is definitely not a one-size-fits-all solution, is there? Because as you rightly point out, Bogota, one of the highest cities, uh, sorry, one of the cities in the world with the highest elevate, uh, altitude, completely different to, for example, Cartagena on the sea um, as well. So. I really like the idea, and you mentioned fun, I really like the idea of being able to take a, a, a sort of a, a system and work into a, a different cities, as you say, in America and in Latin America as well. Does the, does the high altitude, for example, and, and the sea, does that pose a bit of issues when it comes to implementing that ecosystem or does it make it that much more fun and exciting to do? No, it makes it that much more fun and exciting to do. Um, so when you're when you're planning, and this is what something we've learned along the way. This is not something we knew out of the box. We had to learn it. And this is a learning process. And it is for everybody. Anybody who tells you it isn't, <laughs> that's a red flag. <laughs> this is a learning process. And one of the things we learned is that, you know, as you design for high altitude, um, high, high desert or low plain or coastal, you're, you're really designing your air corridors to match the way people live on the ground and just kind of elevate that way of life, right? But what, what you do have to take into effect is aircraft performance. And this really comes into risk mitigation and safety factors. An aircraft is gonna perform much better in Cartagena at sea level because the air is much more dense, right? Density altitude, where in Salt Lake or in Bogota at a much higher altitude, on a hot summer day, like we have to plan for that. You know, someone in Wilmington, North Carolina flying an aircraft almost never has to even think about that. The aircraft performs so well at that low altitude, but on a hot summer day at a high altitude, you do have to plan in those safety factors. And it's something that we learned along the way that you'd have to start plugging that in to your airspace design and land use planning because you have to have so many more uh, safety requirements. And, and a safety requirement in the air mandates a safety requirement on the ground. Uh, absolutely, Jared, as well. I think it's, it's really important, isn't it? And I know many people have talked about it as well, that we need to have all the components of the ecosystem working together. We can't have any sort of the languishing behind. We all need to be at that same level to, to make it all meet, don't we? So, in terms of the cities in Latin America then, Jared, are we the airspace integration as well? Because Latin America as a region is one of the most urban, urbanized regions in the world. Could you see, or do you think we could see more or less EV toll in the sky? I guess it all comes around to the plan in the city uh, around their, the transportation systems that they currently have as well, isn't it? As I know you said in your presentations. Yeah. So that's an interesting, um, you know, I mentioned Salt Lake in New York and, and, um, you know, you hit the point, right? There's urbanized areas in Latin America. Um, and they are very, you know, the population kind of, kind of condenses around this one point. Um, most people don't realize this, but, but Utah, as rural as it is, is an urbanized state because 95% of the population lives right on the Wasatch Front, right? So we hit a lot of the same issues in Utah ironically, that, that you touch in uh, Colombia or any South America. Um, it's very urbanized, you know, a lot of population in a very small geographical spot. Um, so are there going to be more vehicles? That's a great question. One of the things that aerial vehicles do allow is much further distance transportation in a much shorter time. So while it's going to elevate the way we live, right? It might also change the way we live because it's going to change the way we think. 
one of the things that I love to express, and this, you know, as people get used to this, as they get accustomed to going to work or visiting grandma's house via aerial taxi, right, is they're going to see, whether they're at 200 feet or 600 feet, they're going to see how, how the world around them connects. How does it work, right? Um, in urbanized areas, whether you're in Bogota or Salt Lake, you can leave your house, get on a bus and get to work and never really understand how your neighborhood connects with other neighborhoods or industrial areas or commercial areas or the airport or, you know, there are lots of sectors of a city that you just don't see if you leave your house, get on a bus and ride downtown because you just, you can't see it. Right. But if you're above it looking down and you start to realize how connected we are and in what ways we are connected, um, it, it makes a difference, not only in the way you live, but in the way you think. And so I, you know, people will start to realize, yes, I might be able to live a little further out. And this is how I'm still connected to my previous urban environment. Right. Um, and for urban Ur real urban centers, real downtown urban centers and commerce centers, uh, you know, those urban vehicles are probably going to start crossing the city. That's where we'll start, right? Give me from, from point A to point B, and it might just be a short hop across the city. But as people start to learn how connected they are, and now how, how connected even over distances they can be, I think we'll start to see, and I don't want to call it sprawl, I want to call it um, like hubs, right? They'll start to appreciate that there is green space in between point A and point B. And I wanna keep that green space. And I can, because I don't have to lay six lanes of asphalt to get from point A to point B. <laughs> Completely agree, Ajad. And I really like the idea you mentioned about opening up these cities as well and, and really making them have a great appreciation of where, where they are as well, that they don't have to move sort of to the next town or the next city to, for jobs. They can actually still live where they are and connect to their, their job using a, a, an urban air mobility, as we, we suggested as well. Um, you literally sort of uh, took the words right out of my mouth for the next question, really, because it was about your presentation about this new form of aviation, opening up the idea of customers, you know, people that are using this transport, being able to travel further for jobs. But from your own point of view, um, Jared, and all the work that you've been looking at from um, aerial transportation solutions and the work with van vehicles as well, what opportunities do you think this can give customers in Latin America, this urban air mobility idea? That's a great question. Um, and I like, the, I like the fact that you use the word customers because I, I did this with, with Philippe on my, uh, on my Varen Vehicles Think Tank presentation. The customers for any company who's operating these vehicles, they will have customers that pay them to sit in the vehicle. But the transportation system will have not only have those customers, but everybody who's on the ground benefiting from it or even just seeing it being impacted by it is a customer. Right, so you have direct and indirect customers, um, and and I see the benefit for each of those customers. You know, there's pros and cons in all things. Um, you know, one of the things that we will have to track very closely is noise contours, um, or a visual. You know, what's the visual impact on uh, grandma who's 80 years old has never seen anything like this? Maybe gets in a car once in a year and looks up and goes, "Oh my gosh!" Right, like she's a customer and she's impacted. Um, <clears throat> so there's going to be that direct benefit to customers of now I am more connected, more easily, more readily than I ever was before. Traffic jams are a thing of the past for me and I can get to my business meeting quicker and I can have more business meetings and I can do more with my day because my travel time is reduced to almost nothing and I can do it face to face, right? I can add that personal human touch face-to-face. -face. While, while we're doing this over a video conference, right, and most of the world is locked down from COVID, saying that, that we're going to do it face-to-face -face is almost a hard thing to believe at the moment. But that's what, that's what aerial transportation solutions, that's what Varen vehicles, that's what urban air mobility is hoping for, that this really does show us our connections and connect us more. Now, for those people that are on the ground, indirect customers, 
right? What does it do for them? So um, there is a benefit, right? So for every, for every, um, oh, hold on, buddy. Sorry, guys. That's my three-year-old. Uh, working from home, COVID. Uh, so for every vehicle, like drone package delivery, right? For every package or 10 packages or however many packages it take, that's one delivery truck off the road. That's going to cut down your commute if you're on the ground, right? So now this, what's in the air is now a benefit to you on the ground. Um, you know, if you have to get to a work meeting in 30 minutes and you take an aerial vehicle rather than a taxi, well, you just cleared up somebody's space on the ground, right? benefits. Um, if people start to realize, and I should say when, when people start to realize that, you know, I really can have my family located and I don't have to move to the next town, but I can have my family located um, just a little bit outside of the urban economic center and still make it to work on time every day because my commute is much shorter through the air. That's going to start to open up and free up space for other people who are now feeling very, very cramped in those inner suburbs, we'll call it, right? Or those more urban density areas. It's gonna just start to free things up. And as I say that, I know it sounds very much like the sprawl of the 1980s, but that sprawl came with a lot of um, negative impacts. Asphalt, we had delay. Well, we don't have to do that with air, you know, urban air mobility. We don't have to do that. So we do cut out some of the negative impacts, uh, some of the social economic impacts that we experience in the, in the United States from transportation is, you know, where a highway goes through. Does it cut through your neighborhood? Um, we've, had, we've had backyards that have been cut in half because we had to add two extra lanes to a highway, right? Well, you know, those kind of, those type of social economic uh, impacts, negative impacts um, can, can be planned out with, air, with urban air mobility. Uh, and that's one of the things aerial transportation looks at is how does, it, how does this impact every neighborhood and how do we uh, mitigate the, the negative socioeconomic impacts from that transportation just traditionally has always had. Um, and how do we minimize those and how do we make it really equal and fair for all neighborhoods to access every point. Um, so that's, that's really both direct and indirect customers are going to start to feel the benefit and the minimization of negative impacts of transportation. I think that's a brilliant answer, Jared, and, and thank you for that, because I think it's really important that we, we involve everyone in, the, in these conversations as well, and, and I think that's what Felipe and, and everyone at Van Vehicles have done so brilliant with these think tanks, is to really bring the whole hold the industry into these conversations and it's all about bringing them into the conversations and that's why I think the government authorities in, in Colombia um, and, and also the FAA and in the USA and helping to sort of bring these uh, conversations down so we can involve everyone as well. Um, what is there anything you'd like to say sort of about what the starting points might be then for, for Latin America in terms of working with those government authorities to bring those that that need to be involved in these conversations about, as you say, minimalizing the risk for the, for, you know, for the, the, the local neighborhoods that, that want this in their backyard, but maybe might not know too much about it as well. Where, where would you say the starting points are for, for Latin America, for example? I, I would say, you know, for Latin America, um, you know, let's start sitting down with Varen vehicles and ATS right now and start planning both the airspace and the land use, right? Um, any, any urban city. So, and I hope, I hope that the Colombian D secretary of the department of transportation is watching. And I hope that the Bogota minister of transportation is watching and that their city planners are watching, right? Their city engineers are watching because we need to start having those conversations now. Um, this is a new transportation system. It does not go in like magic. It takes planning. It takes urban planning. Uh, and it's not, aviation planners coming in and telling the city planners what to do. Like the city planners really have more of the information that will impact and, and tell us how urban air mobility is going to work and how it's going to be implemented. Right. So we need to start talking with them now, um, meeting with them now to, st to discuss what's the planning process for this. And, and meeting with community leaders, right? Neighborhood leaders and 
what do you want? What do you really want for your neighborhood? Is it just package delivery? And maybe that's where we start, right? We figure, you know, do you want package delivery to each house? Is that even possible? Because because I can find your address at number four, you know, Brookshire Way, but I can't find you at apartment C, number four, Brookshire Way, right? That, that's a little bit difficult. So um, maybe we start talking about, do you want a central a point for package delivery via drones? And maybe that, maybe that unites the community around that central package delivery point, you know? Um, maybe it is, okay, we want a vertiport in our neighborhood, but we have some unique design criteria that fits our neighborhood and we want it to fit our neighborhood this way. And, and maybe every neighborhood is a little bit different, right? Maybe please don't fly over my house. So we designed the approach a little bit different, right? So this is really where neighborhood planning and airspace Aerospace planning have to come together. They have never done that before. They have, this has never happened before. It used to be, you know, okay, we're gonna build a neighborhood, I bought a house, oh my goodness, I didn't know I was under the approach path of the airport. Well, shoot, let's close the airport because I don't like the noise. Like that's how it used to happen. But now we really do need to start working with those community leaders and those city planners right now to start asking neighborhoods how would you like this to work in your neighborhood? That's where we should start. Yeah, all, all brilliant points as well, Joe. And I think it's it's really important again to in, to involve them as well because we're not we're not coming in and saying right, this is how it's going to work, this is what's going to happen. We very much want them to be on board. We want we you know we want what's best for you. These vehicles, although they're going to be several hundred feet above your houses, they are going to be above you and yes you might not like that but tell us you know we want them to keep give that feedback that we can base it on their neighborhoods as well so you know really really interesting points and um, i just wanted to just go back if that's okay on to um the think tank that you were involved in with van vehicles you, you mentioned about in utah um the use of a simulator which kind of tells you how many air taxis can fit in the geograph geographic space of salt lake city could this then be applied to cities such as bogota and cartagena Absolutely, absolutely. So the um, we ATS is working with our, our partner company GORQ and developing it's not only our corridor planning software, but it is our threshold testing software. So we could we could take the the GIS data, we could take the road data or any any data really and um, elevate or design corridors in Bogota that best fits their needs. And then we can say, all right, let's add 500 vehicles simulated and let's run those through this, this planning design and see what happens. And, you know, we can sit down with, uh, you know, if we were to sit down with the Bogota Department of Transportation or the Colombian Department of Transportation and say, okay, we've designed this to your specs. Let's show you how it works before we actually build it. <laughs> let's show you how it might work. And if they see how it works and then they go, oh, well, that was an unintended consequence. We really don't like that there's a, a, a pinch point here, that there's a bottleneck in a traffic jam. How do we change that? And we can change with their inputs, change the de design just a little bit, just tweak it, right? And see if we can fix that, that problem point. And so, yes, those simulations can happen anywhere. They're designed that way. We designed them that way because we want transportation officials and city officials to see how it works before they build it, right? I think that's really important as well, Jared, is the whole idea of visualization. These aircrafts um, are being designed at the moment, so we, we've not really got, there's, although there's a few companies that are doing test flights, I know Volocopter, Lilium, for example, Joby, and Better Technologies uh, recently actually um, performed some flight tests, which is really good, but how important do you think is it then for those who might not necessarily be aware or, or not as sort of it's just get visualization isn't it just putting it in front of them saying this is what it is uh, and they can then get a better idea of how it's going to affect their cities i think you, is that something you agree with and that's very important that we need to address going forward so so yes um and i and i like that you asked that because i would be remiss if i just left with you know here's how the system that we designed together works now let's tweak it right 
But we can also add on to that with, um, okay, we've designed this system and here's how many package delivery drones can go into it. Here's how many aerial taxis, taxis can go into it. We can also, most DOTs, most transportation, most city planners have already something that tells them, you know, peak traffic jam times on the roads or how a community is impacted environmentally by traffic in their neighborhood, right? And we can actually, um, we can actually kind of merge the two together uh, and, and then say, okay, let's take this data simulation and add it to your data simulation and let's see how this actually impacts this as well. You know, so, so it is a, a you're, you're really marrying it all up. Um, so, and we can, we can do both of those, right? We can, we can work with them to do both of those to, to measure uh, impacts on the road system as well. You know, what happens if you take one truck off the road? What happens if you take 10? How does that free your road system up? You know, what happens if you have a uh, hundred package delivery drones? What happens if you have 101? You know, how close can vertiports go together? Is it one every neighborhood? Is it to have to be every two miles, three miles? Like what's the optimal point of that? Um, and those are all things that we can test and, and work with them and show them. And they can make the decisions on really. I don't want to tell them what to do. I want to show them how it works and then have them make the decision and I'll just design it for them. I think you've made some uh, really, really good questions there, Jared. And I think they're really key questions that most cities would need to, to look at and answer themselves as well. So um, I really look forward to seeing following aerial transportation solutions and seeing how you, you process that going forward. Um, it kind of leads me to my penultimate question really, Jared. So in your own words then, what do you think has been the greatest benefit you've gained from being part of this ecosystem in Latin America and also working with van vehicles and Felipe? So uh, Varen Vehicles, Felipe has some really uh, good ideas. I mean, really great ideas, you know, that, that he walked into this um, trying, you know, from, from initially going, this is a really cool concept. I want to build a vehicle to realizing, oh my gosh, there's so much more to the vehicles. And in that process, he brought some brilliant ideas to, I'll call it the industry, right? Like to the industry, he brought some brilliant ideas. Um, especially, I mean, he coined the term geodesics, right? These urban geodesics, these, these uh, areas that are cordoned off or areas that are planned, uh, not cordoned off, but let's say planned for special use. Um, and while that matches a lot of what, uh, a lot of what some of the industry is saying, I think it's taking it just that next step, that next necessary step. And I think he's done that. And for us learning that, you know, for aerial transportation solutions, working with Philippe and, and seeing that cultural perspective that it's hard to get in Utah. <laughs> it, it really is. Let's be honest. It's hard to get in Utah, um, you know, of how someone might feel uh, in, in Latin America, that culture of is, is different than the culture in Utah, right, is different than the culture in, in New York or North Carolina or Florida, <clears throat> and how they feel about getting into a vehicle that is now going to transport them through the air or staying on the ground and knowing that that vehicle is above their head. It's a different feeling, right? Um, for both of those individuals, it's different in Latin America than it is in Utah. And that's what we've learned to, we already knew that we wanted our, our design process to be unique and take into account unique attributes. How far we needed to take that is definitely one of the things we've learned working with variant vehicles and the Latin American ecosystem is how far we really do need to take that. Um, Cause it's going to be different everywhere we go around the world. Great. So some really nice words there, um, Jared. And I, I completely echo your thoughts as well. I think the think tanks have been brilliant to, educate me and, and the rest of the industry about all the work that's being done in Latin America. Um, so um, I'm really excited to see what the future holds, um, both for brown vehicles and also for aerial transportation solutions as well. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation, Jared, some, some brilliant, brilliant um, topics discussed. Is there any final conclusions that you wanted to address that maybe I've not mentioned uh, in our conversation? Um, you know, the only thing I would, I would say is, uh, 
you know, I don't, so one of the things we have learned um, is that we're not sure what the first headline should be, right? What's the first South American headline? And I think Philippe has that vision. I think Philippe has that vision. I think he's got that well wrapped up. For us in Utah, we wanted it to be drone safe flight because that was what was going to make things move in Utah, right? But for South America, I think Philippe has that. I don't really know what it was, but I trust, I trust that he has it and we want to help him achieve it. Um, and I will say that, that that's really part of the politics of this, right? Is in aviation, you, nothing flies without politics. And so understanding those politics, understanding what people will accept and what they won't accept um, is what's going to move this forward. Uh, it's, it's not going to be the science of the vehicle. It's not going to be point A to point B in a straight line. You know, most, I, I've heard industry professionals say, well, I don't know. I don't like your plan, your ecosystem. I'm just going to go in a straight line because that's the shortest point, you know, shortest distance between two points. And I'm like, uh, people aren't going to let you do that right? It's the politics that drives this. It always has been, and it always will be. And if I were to say anything uh, in closing, I think that starting with that in mind, starting with the way Varen Vehicles has done this, gathering people, getting all this input, educating, and learning at the same time, that really is the politics that are going to start this and keep it moving in the future. And I appreciate about that about them, because I have felt the same way since day one. So I'm glad to find a, a, a counterpart that believes and thinks the same way we do. Some brilliant, brilliant closing remarks, uh, Jad. So thank you ever so much for your time today. I'm wishing you all the very best in the future. I'd love to continue the conversations um, further with you as well. Um, and thank you also for those watching. Um, don't forget, there's a huge amount of content available on the skyscraper section of uh, Van Vehicles website, uh, which also includes Jared's presentation as well. So you, to watch that and all the other content, head to www.vanvehicles.com forward slash skyscraper 2020. So Jared, until next time, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason.